Well, welcome back, friends. We just want to say thank you for joining us on this very special day, uh, the day of Pentecost. Um, as we get ourselves ready uh, for the word of the Lord, I want to encourage you, let's take a moment to just pray and seek God's uh, His face and His will, His ways, His anointing. And so let's, let's take a moment and do that now. Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for the opportunity that we have to uh, share and to speak into each other's lives. Father, I pray that you would lead us and guide us during this time. Father, I pray that your glory would be revealed in us and through us and to the world around us. Lord God, we love you and we praise you and we seek your face. We say these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus, the name above every name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, guys, this is uh, this is week 11 uh, with our COVID-19 uh, adventure. And I'm sure by now it's kind of um, old news, old hat, and we're kind of tired of it, kind of ready to go uh, explore, get back to life, uh, go on a, a other adventures, uh, maybe do some camping trips, things like that as the uh, summer months are upon us. And the heat is turned up and uh yeah fans are on air conditioners are working all that good stuff well um this this historically the day of pentecost has been a very very special day and a sacred day to the church and i want to to help us kind of understand that and to help understand its significance um what is the day of pentecost i had some people ask me that uh, this past week, as I said, hey, this next Sunday is going to be Pentecost. Uh, people are like, okay, well, what is Pentecost? What does that mean? Uh, to kind of help us understand that, it's like, uh, let me ask you, have you have you ever celebrated a birthday for either yourself or for a loved one? And how, how important is that birthday? Um, it's, it's mine, August 6th. What's so significant about August 6th? Well, not so much anything to the world in which we live, but to me personally, it's kind of significant. To my, my, my friends, to my family, um, it's very significant because that's the day that I was born, uh, came into the world. And so Pentecost is uh, kind of viewed the same way. It's the birth of the church. It is the day that uh, the church started its mission to the world. And so what is Pentecost? It's a very significant time uh, in the history of the church, the Bride of Christ. This is, it is seven weeks, seven sevens, from Passover, Jewish holiday, Passover, or what we call Easter or Resurrection Sunday, uh, to this day. So seven sevens from, from Passover to Pentecost. It's seven sevens, that's 49 days plus one. It's the day after the Sabbath that gives it that one day. That's where they get the word Pentecost from. We use the word uh, pentagram, um, a five-point star. We use the word pentagon, the, the building back in Washington, D.C., um, in Maryland, and we're somewhat familiar with that, but it means five, in this case 50, it's it's representing 50 days, and 50 days of what, of celebration? No, 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 it's 50 days since the Passover, and in the Old Testament, this was something that God had prescribed as a, uh, a festival time. This was a time that was called the Feast of Weeks. It is also called um, the Festival of Weeks or Shavat in the the Jewish uh, calendar on the Jewish uh, uh, customs and, and whatnot. But you can see the one of the first mentions of this this time found in Leviticus chapter twenty three, verse fifteen and sixteen. I'll read this from the New Living Translation. It says, "From the day after the Sabbath." The day you bring the bundle of grain to be lifted up as a special offering, count off seven 
seven full weeks. Keep counting until the day after the seventh Sabbath, 50 days later. Then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. So this is again in Leviticus chapter 23, kind of setting the uh, the context. God is uh, through through Moses, he is commanding the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, to uh, set aside certain feast days, festival times, during the course of the year. And Passover is a very big deal. But so was seven sevens later, the festival of weeks, Shavat, or what we call Pentecost. It was very significant and sacred. And this is very important because this is something that God had established on, on his calendar on his timeline and he he asked he told the children of Israel you need to celebrate during this time and he's putting he's ingraining into their culture something very significant so but as we fast forward to um, to the time of Christ what is this day the day of Pentecost again in the New Testament what is what is that about uh, well, in a nutshell, this is the day that the Holy Spirit of God descended from heaven and filled the disciples and the believers who were gathered together in Jerusalem. And it was about 10 days after uh, Jesus ascended up into heaven. Uh, and why is this, why is this significant? This, the Holy Spirit coming down and filling the believers, why is this significant? Well, for a whole lot of reasons. First of all, it's because it fulfilled Jesus' promise. It, it, Jesus even says it fulfills the promise of the Father. So it not only fills, fulfills Jesus' promise, but it fulfills God's promise to send the Comforter, the great and mighty Holy Spirit. Um, that is... That is the supernatural equipping, empowering, that would help the church be empowered to do the task that Jesus had left for it. That is the evangelism of the world. To, to really understand the significance and importance of this, I would ask you to consider the condition that the first disciples were in after the resurrection and leading up to the ascension. Um, if you stop and consider where these, where the disciples, okay, they just, in, you know, went through the whole, the, 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 the cross, the crucifixion, they saw Jesus die, they saw him uh, be buried, and then three days later, he comes back to life. Okay, that's a very, very powerful thing. But they, they went about their life almost from the time of the resurrection, um, uh, you know, up to the point of the ascension, they kind of went back to, what do we do with our lives? I know, we'll just go back to our lives. Uh, we had talked about in weeks previous how Jesus was uh, intermittently with them from that point on. He was with them for three plus years, three and a half years. He was with them. They They hung out together. They learned. They, you know, the disciples learned together. They, excuse me, they ministered together. They um, they walked with Jesus on a daily basis, on a consistent basis. They took takeout together. Come on, guys. Uh, ordered from the same restaurant, whatever the case was. Um, people say, well, what kind of car would Jesus would have driven, you know, back in the day? Well, some people say, well, he, he would have been a biker, you know. Um, he, he would have, he, he would have, uh, scripture says that, uh, uh, his triumph roared throughout the land. Yeah. Okay. So he would have rode a triumph motorcycle or no, no, no. Other people say the disciples, they, they were in a Hyundai or no, was in an accord because all the disciples were in one accord or one person said that, uh, no, no, it would have been a 15 passenger van. I mean, come on. There's a lot of them here. And they're all full grown. And there's luggage, possibly. Well, point is, uh, they hung out with Jesus on a very consistent daily basis. And at this point in time, after his 
resurrection from the dead. He is now intermittently with them. He's not with them like they once knew before. Their lives have changed. Their world has changed. Their world view has changed. But they're still struggling as to what they're going to do in life. Where do they go from here? And it's during this time frame that Jesus had some very specific and special instructions for them. And we're going to read about that here in just a moment. But as they are learning together and growing together, and as powerful as the, the resurrection was, okay, as powerful as the resurrection was, it did not empower them. Okay? We're going to look at that, and I, I would ask you to stop and consider this as Jesus is telling the guys, uh, telling his followers, men and women, he's telling them all, um, there is more for you. I have a plan I need you to execute, and you're not going to do this alone. I'm going to send the great and mighty Holy Spirit, and he's going to help you. Uh, let's look at this in Acts chapter 1, okay? Let's see what the scriptures actually have to say about this. In Acts chapter 1, starting with verse 1, <clears throat> I will read out of the uh, New King James Version. It says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, and until the day that in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them for forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Verse 4, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel. And he said to them, it is, not for, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the world, or excuse me, to the end of the earth. Verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, I want to say real quick, guys, this passage is so, so packed with so many wonderful, wonderful implications and meanings, okay? Uh, for instance, I remember when I was going to school at Rayma, uh, uh, the incoming dean, his name was Gary Crowell, he preached a message on uh, this verse, it says in Verse 4, being assembled together with them, he commanded them. In other words, this is not a suggestion. This is not a strong urgence. This is not a recommendation. The Bible says that Jesus commanded his disciples. It's one of those, do not leave home without the Holy Spirit. Okay? So that's a very, very powerful uh, uh, word right here in just, in just that. Um, other things to stop and consider, as he's speaking to his disciples about the incoming power of the Holy Spirit, power to be a witness and to, to, to testify about him, they're asking questions like, hey, tell us you know, about the end times. Is this, is this it, where we are? Uh, you know, eschatologically speaking, um, you know, what's the timeline looking like? Is this the time you're going to be restoring your kingdom to Israel? Or, or what, what, what have we got going on? And Jesus is like, time out, guys, time out. It's not about the times and the seasons right now, okay? Your job, the message that I have for you, the job that I have for you, the opportunities that I, that, that I have for you, you're going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit, not an inferior Holy Spirit, not a different Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that empowered me to do the job that I did, 
It's going to be on you and in you and with you. Don't get caught up about end times. Don't get caught up with, oh my goodness, is this the end? Don't get caught up with that. The Father knows what He's doing. Trust in Him. But you, on the other hand, get to work. Okay? Matter of fact, He says, don't get to work until you're, you're endued with this power from on high. Okay? And, uh, again, there's so many amazing and wonderful things in this passage. Um, I've heard many ministers speak on the subject of, uh, you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Uh, well, Jerusalem kind of, you know, home base, so to speak. So, you know, knock out your neighborhood first, and then your, then your county, and then your state, and then, you know, go on further from there before you try and tackle, you know, being a missionary on the foreign fields. You know, start being a witness. Uh, start being a witness right where you are. Start being a witness to me, to Jesus, um, in your own backyard, to your own neighbors, to your own community. Be a witness to me, of me, to them. Start, don't don't have grandiose ideas. Well, I'll go to the other side of the world, and I'll knock the thing, I, you know, I'll hit a home run, and then I'll come back, and I got this all figured out. Again, guys, <laughs> wonderful things pulled from this passage. But what we're looking at right now, um, <laughs> the whole ball of wax we're looking at the day of Pentecost, what this day means, what it means to us, what it means to us right now, this day. Where are we at? May 31st, 2020. What does Pentecost look like today? What does it mean today? How powerful it is, how significant it is, how absolutely necessary it is. So, I love this. Let's, uh, let's keep reading. It says, uh, verse 9, Now when he had said these things, when Jesus had said these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, and said to them, this is two angels, and said to them, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken taken up from you into heaven will also come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. This is kind of a peculiar statement. This is a you know a very peculiar uh, passage. You know, as Jesus is speaking to his disciples. I don't know about you, but I've never had a conversation with somebody and they started to lift up off of the earth. That's never happened to me. And so, I mean, their response is kind of like, yeah, it's normal for their response. They're like this. And these angels are coming and going, Guys, your gob is open. You're saying, why are you staring up into heaven? I guess angels see this stuff kind of on a regular basis, ascending and descending or whatever the case is, the goings, ins and outs uh, uh, of the earth. Maybe it's a normal occurrence to them. Who knows? But it wasn't to them, and it's certainly not to us. Up, up, and away. I mean, this mm -mm, this is very unique. This is a, a, an amazing and mighty and majestic display of Jesus' ascension into heaven. Uh, and, <laughs> and the angels ask a very peculiar question. Why are you staring? I got no answer. I guess because my mind is blown? You know, I, I don't know. I'd stare too. Well, I love what uh, Jerry Cook, his little take on this. Um, Jerry Cook writes, 
He says, their times together since Jesus' resurrection had given them very little to work with. Jesus said, I'm going away. Where are you going? You can't come. What should we do? Go tell the world about me. How do we manage that? The Holy Spirit will show you. Where are we going to find him? Go back to Jerusalem. He'll find you. That's almost like saying, don't call us. We'll call you. Okay, it's not that bad, but kind of like it. Okay, and then as he's telling them this, go back to Jerusalem. He'll find you. And he's gone. <laughs> the thing is, guys, why did Jesus leave? This had to be running through the minds of the disciples. you you got to understand. The scripture says in this passage, uh, Acts chapter 1, that Jesus, he, from his resurrection, which we know Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, Okay, this is uh, right on the coattails of, of the Passover. He hung out with them for 40 days intermittently. He would appear, then disappear. You could read about this in the last chapters of John, um, where he, you know, showed up. They're out there fishing. And he says, children, have you got any fish? Uh, no, we'll catch your net on the other side. And they did, and wow, a lot of fish. Um, another miracle and then oh hey it's the Lord and, and Peter jumps in throws his clothes on jumps in and then you know swims up to shore and hey how you doing <laughs> yeah anyways so they're having a uh, Jesus was in in and out for 40 days and now all of a sudden um, he's gone he's gone he has sins this is glorious. He ascends to heaven. This is powerful. This is impactful. But they got to be asking the question, why is he leaving? Why does he why is he leaving us? And he tells them, we read about this in, in Matthew, uh, in the Great Commission and in Mark, um, I'm not leaving you orphans. I'm not leaving you orphans. I am with you until the end of the age. And that's through the agency of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're going to look at today. Uh, through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Through the empowering and the equipping of the Holy Spirit. Through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now this is very important. Why did Jesus leave? It's because, honestly guys, Jesus is not trying to multiply his followers. Now hold on. Did you just hear what I said? Jesus is not trying to multiply his followers. He is trying, he is wanting to multiply himself through his followers. Why did Jesus leave? Because if Jesus stayed, stayed there would be only one. But when he left and the Holy Spirit came, he now can, God's plan of redemption was that as new creations in Christ, as we are, as it says in John chapter 3, we are born again, born anew. First Corinthians talks about being a new creation in Christ. God's plan has always been not to come and dwell with us. Hi, how you doing? I'm good, how you doing? I'm great now that you're here. That was not his plan. It was not to be with us, but to be in us. There's a passage in the scriptures that says, Christ in me, the hope of glory. Why did Jesus leave? So that he wouldn't just be with the disciples with the believers, with the church, with 
me and you. But through the agency of the Holy Spirit, he could be in the disciples. He could be in the believers. He could be in the church. He could be in me and you. This is, again, pointing to the significance of the day of Pentecost. As powerful, again, as his resurrection was, it did not empower. The disciples, they saw the risen Lord, but they still cowered in fear behind locked doors. Jesus is essentially telling them, hey, I'm going to leave here in just a, just a minute, up, up, and away, and you're going to stay, and you're going to be a witness to me. The Holy Spirit's going to come, and he's going to, you know, empower you to go and be a witness to me, and you're going to start in Jerusalem. Oh, by the way, that's the city that just killed me, Jesus, and they blamed you for stealing my body to cover up my resurrection. I want you to start there. Yeah, not easy. How are you going to do that? Uh, we're going to start with a locked door. We're going to start with a prayer closet. That was not the plan of God. The plan of God was that they start with tongues of fire. They start boldly and loudly declaring the wonderful works of God. That was his, his plan. So, again, guys, what is this? As we, as we keep unfolding this, this Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, what it means to us, what it means to you, what it means to me, um, what is this? I don't really care what your background is. Maybe you're Pentecostal and you're like, yeah, preach your brother. Maybe you're charismatic saying, get to the tongues part. Maybe you're a little bit more reserved uh, and saying, I'm not a, you know, interested in, in, in tongues or, or glossolalia or, or any of this you know, mumbo jumbo you know, weird stuff. Neither, I'm not interested in mumbo jumbo either. I'm very interested in the Bible. And I was taught many years ago, if you want to have a Bible experience, then go back to the Bible. See what the Bible has to say. Uh, go for the experiences that God is endorsing and, and uh, giving. And those are the things that we are going to look forward to and embrace and be available to and open ourselves up to. And so if you're not comfortable with the subject of tongues, okay, are you comfortable with talking about being bold, being empowered, living a life that is so much bigger and better then your plan, go ahead and jumping on the train that leads to God's plan. That's what we're wanting to talk about. That's why Pentecost is so absolutely necessary and so absolutely significant. All right, let's keep going. Acts chapter 1. Let's get back to Acts chapter 1. We'll pick up where we left off. Uh, verse 11. We're going to jump on to verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath, day, Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, excuse me, when they had entered, they went went up into the upper room where they were staying. Now this is very important because it kind of gives a list of who all's in the room. It says uh, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew. James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. Uh, Judas Iscariot was no longer with him. Uh, verse, verse 14, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. Not just twelve guys, but the women were there. And... I would ask you to underline this in your Bible. This is very powerful to me. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, and 
with his brothers. The scripture keeps going on and talks about how there's 120 people in that upper room. And that's significant to me because that was all of the disciples that were there. Uh, this passage goes on, you know, Peter stands up and says, Hey guys, uh, Judas Iscariot is no longer with us. Um, you know, I believe that the, uh, the scripture says, uh, let's, let's, you know, find somebody to take his place. Um, somebody that's been with us since Jesus' baptism at the Jordan River, uh, all the way, you know, through, through till now. And, and they, they selected, uh, two candidates, um, not by popular vote, but by seeking the Lord, they decided, hey, this is the guy. The scripture goes on to say there was 120 people there with him in the upper room. But this is important because it's the 12 disciples and then the women that, that continued in the ministry to help them. But Jesus' own mama was there. Now this becomes very significant when you turn the page and you read the very next chapter. Because it's talking about the exact same people. Now get this. Um, yeah, I'll get just a moment. I'll come back to that thought. Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 1. We're going to read 1 through 4. New King James. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come. Something about that phrase only. I believe is very significant and very special. When the day of Pentecost had fully come. Why does that verse stand out to me? I believe it's because God knew back when he told Moses 1,500 years ago or previous to this. So now 3,500 years from, from us back to then or whatever the case may be. If my math is wrong, don't write me a letter point is, okay, um, God knew clear back then, this day, and this Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, is a very significant one, somewhat unique. In all the years leading up to it, this one took on whole new meaning. And, and it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. In other words, God was so stacking this thing up, getting everything ready. It's polished. It's ready. And now it's here. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they, they who? The 120, the disciples, the women that were in the ministry, uh, helping um, Mary, Jesus' own mama, and his brothers. His brothers were there. They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing, mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all, 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 and in the Greek, all means all. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What? This is powerful because that means Jesus' own mama experienced this. That means not just Peter. Not just James, not just John, but Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas the son of James, and all that continued uh, with one accord, uh, the women, Jesus' own mama, Jesus' brothers, all of these guys received this this supernatural blessing gift from God. This is viewed by most theologians that I'm aware of. Perhaps there's some out there that don't, I haven't heard of, that don't agree, I don't know. 
Um, but this is viewed by most theologians as the birth of the church. Now, I want you to stop and consider that. If that is correct, which I believe that it is, if that is correct, then the birth of the church, what happened? Jesus, or excuse me, God poured out His Spirit, the same Spirit that was upon Jesus. He poured it out during the most vulnerable but intimate and delicate time on the bride, the church. And what happened? Tongues. If tongues were such a obnoxious nuisance, then why did God do it on the birth day of the bride of Christ? I don't have an answer unless it's not a nuisance but it's an empowerment you shall be endued with power from on high when the Holy Spirit comes upon you you'll be my witnesses to the end of the earth starting at home going out from there it's a blessed thing it's a wonderful thing but look what else happens they moved get this guys why were they in the upper room they weren't just up there trying to have a church service or some kind of meeting. They were up there because they were locking away themselves for fear of the, the leaders. Hear me now. This is where it parks itself right in our business. Because of fear of the leaders. They didn't agree with them. They were afraid of them. They felt like the leaders were out to get them, and in this case, they truly were out to get them. But they were also cowering because of the civil authorities, not just the spiritual leaders, but the civil authorities. And remember, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees were the chief uh, uh, driving factors. Um, the, the spiritual leaders that crucified Jesus, but it was the Romans who did this as well. And so you have to stop and understand that the 120 were behind closed doors. And there was a lot of fear in the room. And this is during a time which should have been a celebration. But they weren't celebrating. They were praying. They were in harmony. They were in unity in one accord. But they weren't bold. They weren't living life boldly. They were living life in fear and timidity. But then as soon as the Holy Spirit came, that empowerment, that gift, it changed everything. It is my firm conviction and belief that right now the world, the world in which you and I live, desperately needs another outpouring on the day of Pentecost. An outpouring so grand, so great, that it moves the believers out of fear and into faith. Out of timidity and into boldness. Right now, our world is literally trying to tear itself apart. Literally. My wife, Pastor Kelly, just told me that Salt Lake City, right now, has a mandatory curfew in place. Uh, what, what is the time from 8 p.m.? Curfew's at 8 p.m., and this is going to last until Monday. Curfew's at 8 p.m., and it lasts till Monday. Why? Because all across our country, all across our, our cities and nation right now, there are riots being uh, taking place, um, starting in um, an injustice done in uh, Minnesota, it was, right? Where a police officer brutally killed a, uh, a man in, in, in handcuffs. And I don't... You know, don't please don't 
please do please do not misunderstand me. I am not okay with that. But a lot of people have decided that the police are the problems. A lot of people right now, because of this COVID lockdown, have had enough. And they're saying the governors, the, the, the ruling authorities, uh, those crazy Democrats or those radical, stupid Republicans or whatever, the political, it's just tearing itself apart right now. In, in Utah alone, there were, what was it, two cars? Two car fires? People caught cars on fire? There was looting of businesses? There was um, people being interviewed on the news with uh, AR-15 and, and handguns all down the way, fully loaded, saying, I'm ready for the trouble. Like, are you kidding me? I just came back from uh, seeing Pastor Rob, uh, our district supervisor up north, and he was called in. Um, a day or two ago, he was just called in because a policeman was responding to a... Uh, what is it called? Domestic, domestic violence. violence. Uh, a policeman was responding to a de domestic violence re report, and several police showed up, and this officer, 24 years old, 24 years old, Officer Nate, who had only been on the force in Ogden 15 months, was shot in the head and killed, and Pastor Rob went as the as the the police chaplain to go and pray with the police officers the men who are literally serving who are endeavoring to keep the peace this was a domestic violence and and this guy he shot and killed this officer and then he shot another officer uh shot up and and what is going on Guys, we desperately need Jesus. We desperately need His empowerment to live boldly. When I'm talking about boldly, I'm not talking about arrogantly, flamboyantly, in your face and obnoxiously. That is not the ways of God. When I'm talking about boldly, I'm talking about doing the things that Jesus did. Living the way that He called to live. He said that his disciples would be marked and known by, to the world by their love, love for one another. Not their ability to stand up and say, this is unconstitutional. Or their ability to, 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 to form a march against our civil authorities. Oh, by the way, the scriptures are very clear. We're, we're to sub, uh, submit ourselves and to pray for our governors, to, to pray for our leaders, our rulers. Our, well, we don't have a king, but we do have a president. We are called by God to pray for them. Funny thing is, they are calling on us right now. To pray for them, to pray for them, to pray that God would give them wisdom and insight and understanding and how to rule in a very chaotic time. I would not wish to be them. I absolutely, I'd poof, to be them. God bless them. We need their help. We need their leadership. And there are so many people criticizing and ridiculing every single decision out of either the White House or the, the, the mayor's office or the governor's office or whatever, the chief police's office. All these people are criticizing and these people are doing more for their country, more for their citizens, more for their people than you and I are doing. So we need to get behind them and we need to encourage them. We need to cheerlead them. We need to uh, just, just, hey, we're praying for you guys. We're praying for you guys. And why would we do that? That's living boldly in a world that is just crazy. We need the Holy Spirit power and fire inside of us so that we can go out there and live the life that God has called us to live. The funny thing is uh, about Jesus. I never, I, I've never read a Bible. I've read the entire scriptures several times, multiple times. Some of them hundreds of times, some passages hundreds of times, and I have never even heard of the idea that Jesus started a riot or that Jesus cast a stone. 
Matter of fact, there's an opportunity, a golden opportunity, that Jesus was called upon to cast the first stone. And he says, no, you without sin cast the first stone. In other words, the only one here qualified to be the rightful judge, a right judge, a righteous judge, is me. And I'm not here to throw stones. I'm here to save this world. Christians, if we're to look and to act like and to be empowered like our Creator, our, our, our Messiah, our Savior, Jesus, then why aren't we doing that? Why are we instead seeing our friends and our, fr our family and, and, and members of our community rising up in arms against, to, to, to champion the cause of riotousness, not righteousness? This, this ought not be. This ought not be. Guys, we need the Holy Spirit to infill our lives. God knows exactly where we're at. He knows exactly what He's doing. I'm asking you, I'm calling on you to trust in Him. He has never failed us, not one time. Can we trust Him? Well, well, the, if this COVID thing doesn't get you know under hat quick, if we don't get a handle on this, what happens if it you know breaks back out? Is that going to do another lockdown? Well, I'm not going to have it. I'm not going to stand for it. I'm not going to let them tell me I can't go to work. What about the pick up your cross? How about die to yourself daily? We have literally no idea what persecution is. You want to know what persecution is? There's an amazing book called Tortured for Christ put out by uh, people who, who, who are martyrs for Christ. Uh, people who are aware of these stories to try and show us that people are literally dying because they're not fighting. They're dying because they're turning the other cheek. They're dying because they're walking in love. Funny thing about sheep. Sheep aren't, for the most part, sheep, lambs, they're not aggressive. I've never had a sheep run up to me and hit me with its little head try and knock me over or tell me who's boss. I've never had that. Ha I have had that with goats. I've had that on numerous occasions, uh, occasions being around goats. But I've never had that around sheep. I was talking to uh, another pastor in the area, uh, Pastor Kevin Jensen, and he said something to me um, that was just, it, it was mind-blowing. Uh, I've never heard this before. He said, something funny about sheep is, they will, they will imitate or mirror the characteristic of their shepherd. And I'm like, huh? He says, if you've got a shepherd uh, out there amongst his sheep, and he's kind of harsh and rough, uh, he's just kind of plowing his way through, them sheep will respond the same way. They'll start behaving that way. They'll start to be jerks to each other. They start, you know, shoving and fighting and, and, and whatnot. Um, and, and the shepherd gets to a point where he can't even walk through his sheep because they're just obnoxious. He says, but when you got another shepherd and he's kind to the sheep, he's soft-spoken, he's responsive to them, they're responsive to him. And they start to respond the same way. Well, guys, we're the sheep of our great shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. How are we responding? Is our characteristics mirroring his characteristics? Pardon the question. Jesus said something very profound. This is just as much for today as it has ever been at any point in time in history. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents 
and harmless as doves. In other words, guys, how clear of a heads up do we need? How, how, how clear does he need to, to tell us what our behavior should look like? The Bible says about him, concerning his, his time before the, the highest civil authority of the land in the moment, uh, Pontius Pilate, that he was led before the shearers, or excuse me, he was led before the, the, uh, the slaughter. It, it, he kept his mouth shut. He didn't revile. He didn't approach. Before Pontius Pilate, Pilate said, I have the power, buddy. I have the power. I'm the man. I could crush you. I could kill you. I could crucify you. I also have the power to let you go. Jesus said, the only power that you have over me is the power that's been given to you. But this is the hour. I'm paraphrasing. This is the hour that darkness will reign. Jesus did this by the power of the Holy Spirit. If Jesus was able to keep his cool when darkness was reigning, how much more do we need the day of Pentecost to fill us up with the same Holy Spirit so that we can maintain ourselves in our current conditions? The message of Pentecost is absolutely for today. The message of Pentecost is the same that he told the disciples, don't leave home without this. This is so special. This is so sacred. My mama's going to be a tongue-talking Jew. She's going to be filled with the same spirit of the living God that's in me. It's going to be in her. In her. Filling her. Transforming her. And Peter and James and John and the boys. My followers, my believers. All of my disciples. That day as the day progressed, scores, thousands came to Christ. Was it 3,000 came to Christ that day? 2,000, I believe it was 3,000 came to Christ that day. One message by some fishermen perfectly quoting scripture verses in obscure passages. Joel, this is the day, this is what the prophet Joel was talking about. Quotes him verbatim perfectly. That's by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hiding away, I mean, come on. 50 days ago, Peter was vested by a 14 or 15 year old girl. Hey, 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 you're one of his disciples. I've done seeing you. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Heck no. Don't know who you're talking about. I ain't one of them. No, no, no. Oh, your accent, buddy. Uh, I speak you no know, accent. Uh. Come on. Really? Uh, I'm not with the demon. Okay, Mr. Schwarzenegger, you're not with kids. That's all right, whatever. Okay, no, no, Penta. <laughs> yeah, okay, anyways. So, when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, on the day of Pentecost, and we're making ourselves available, we're together, we're honoring God, I believe with all my heart that there are fruits of the Holy Spirit they should start to bear fruit and bear witness in our lives. They should start to arrive. They should start to manifest in our lives. Uh, these fruits are found in Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to read this. Galatians chapter 5, uh, starting with verse 22. We'll read the, through the rest of the passage. It says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, This is important, guys. Why? Because these are abilities, super abilities, 
supernatural abilities that are beyond your normal scope and reach. These are by and through and from the Holy Spirit. An ability to love when it is just impossible. Ability to have joy. The ability to, to have peace. I've always marveled at this, the peace that passes understanding. What does that mean? That means when it is crazy, chaotic, and hectic. You have peace? That means when the boat is being tossed to and fro, you're like Jesus. You probably scooted right up next to Jesus, who's asleep in the helm. Just, yeah. It's peace. Long suffering. God knows we need this. Kindness. When was the last time you were kind? I hope often. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness. Gentleness. Self control. This verse goes on to say, against such things, there is no law. Those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. In other words, guys, stop fleshing out. Walk in the Spirit. How? Because it's the day of Pentecost, the day that you, can, you and I can make ourselves available to be filled with the Spirit of God. When the Spirit of God comes inside us, we have supernatural ability. to We have empowerment from heaven to live the life that God has called us to live. You're not called to live this alone. You're called to live this with Him, by Him. By His Spirit. We, you and I, need this. I would just like to close with this. I would like to offer a prayer. If you've never, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, continue reading this. The book of Acts is full of amazing, amazing opportunities. Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 8, I believe it's Acts chapter 10. Uh, there's passage after passage after passage after passage. It talks about being filled. And get this, being refilled. What do you mean refilled? But the, doesn't he go in and then it's done? You know, once filled, always filled? No, it's like, you know, I filled my car with gas. You use it and it gets empty. You got to go refill. Well, it's the same as with the Christian life. You, 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 you get filled up and then you go out and walk it out and you find yourself a court low. So you've got to get refilled. How do you know you're a court low? When you start to get irritable, when you start to get snappy, when you start to consider riots or entertaining ideas of, um, well, I'm justly justified in my perceived wrongdoing that was done to me, so I'm angry and I'm considering lashing out. Mm, court low. Court low. I would just say, Go ahead and, 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 okay, Lord, I want this. I want to be filled. I want to be refilled. I want you and you only, God. I want everything that you have for me. What does that look like? It looks like this. Father, right now I ask that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. This is a very, very precious day and a very, very significant day. God, this was the day that you gave birth to the church by the entrance of your Holy Spirit. Fill us. We make ourselves available to you and you only. We love you and we praise you and we seek your face. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. I'd love to hear if that was the first time you've ever prayed that. I would love to hear it. Uh, like, subscribe, post, right. Um, if, if you would like to know more about this, 
I would love to talk to you about this. If you're interested in a fight or a debate, I'm just not. I'm just not interested. I could tell you, I lived, I'm going to be 40 this year. I lived half of my life till I was 19 years old without this experience, this spirit-filled experience. I was a believer in Jesus. These guys were believers in Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, hold up. You need more. Well, I went and looked. 19 years old in Africa. I found the power of God. I encountered this spirit-filled experience. And I could tell you, half of my life without it, and half of my life with it. Oh, it's way better here. The half with it. If you want to, if you want to know more about this, yeah, talk to me. Love to talk to you about this. Um, or just read the scriptures yourself. The book of Acts, the entire book is full of this. Romans chapter eight, the book of Jude, it mentions this. Uh, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 14, Paul the Apostle says, I thank God I pray in tongues more than you all. I mean, how much more validation do we need? He says, you know, do not forbid speaking in tongues. How much more validation? Oh, I know, Mark chapter 16, the Great Commission, Jesus said, and they will speak with new tongues. I mean, if Jesus is giving it a thumbs up, Peter, James, John, all the disciples, Apostle Paul saying, yeah, baby, mother, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus is like, whew, this is good stuff. Then why aren't we? Oh, I know, because it's weird. We'll unpack that another time. For now, Embrace this day. Embrace the meaning of it. Embrace the significance. And embrace the fact that we absolutely need this in our world right now. Embrace the fact that, that God wants to do things in us, for us, and through us. Love you guys. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of your day.